so loved ones in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, dear friends, we uh, considered in the first uh, service this morning uh, the ascendancy of uh, King Solomon to the throne and uh, maybe a, a couple of points about that that uh, will give meaning in uh, the context to the passage that is before us uh, right now. Uh, first of all, uh, there was a, a big to-do in First Kings about uh, Solomon actually being the one who ascended to the throne uh, after uh, the death of King David, the man after God's own heart. Uh, it doesn't surprise us when uh, we think back to uh, King David passing on in incredible weakness, uh, incidentally, that uh, there was jockeying for the throne of Israel and of Judah. In a particular, one of the sons of David, uh, Adonijah, had uh, said it in his heart that he was uh, not only uh, willing to serve as the king, but that presumptuously he was the one who should be the king and had all of the gifts and the power and the political savvy uh, to get to the throne and to stay there, but the Lord had other plans. And uh, interestingly, Solomon and Adonijah, at least uh, Solomon's representatives, who were working very diligently to get Solomon to the throne, and Adonijah, both uh, used questionable tactics and displayed by their actions in trying to get the throne um, questionable intentions uh, as to why they wanted to sit on the throne, uh, they were in parallel in that way in terms of their presumption and sin, uh, but the Lord, for his own purposes, decided to put Solomon on the throne. Solomon was God's anointed, and that's an important uh, point to keep in mind. Uh, after which, uh, he raised Solomon to an incredible uh, royal splendor that has been unmatched in the history of the world to that time for any king, and uh, really since in terms of his universal uh, riches and splendor and wisdom and, uh, that was bestowed upon him. If ever there was a king who uh, demonstrated the, uh, the skillfulness and the blessing of God uh, and the riches that God bestows upon an earthly power whom he has placed for his purposes, then Solomon was it. And uh, here we come now to the sort of outworking of the reign of King Solomon in Old Testament times being appointed by the Lord and having this really uh, just unending supply of riches and resources uh, uh, at his disposal because of the Lord's blessing. Here we come to Solomon actually now uh, going forward in his kingship. And it's interesting that uh, the first thing that Solomon purports to do is to, uh, to build a temple for, for the Lord who has placed him in power. Uh, temples in the ancient world were not uncommon. Uh, all of the uh, various uh, dwellers of the land of Palestine at that time had their various gods, and uh, for those gods, they built their earthly temples. Uh, Solomon, very probably, in, uh, in a recognition, a humble recognition, of uh, the Lord it being the one who had placed him in power and blessed him, and uh, given him a security in terms of uh, the international world that uh, his, his father David himself never even enjoyed, in gratitude to God for his blessing, in an acknowledgement of uh, having received all the good things that he had received, not from himself, but from the Lord, and in his desire to have these blessings secured and his kingship be sturdy and unshakable, uh, Solomon decides that obviously, he, he needs to uh, build a temple for the Lord to dwell among his people. It is uh, Solomon's way of expressing his gratitude to the Lord and also uh, securing uh, the flourishing of his kingdom. But what is, uh, what is probably the most striking to us uh, about King Solomon building the temple is not so much what his motivation is in building it, but what the way in which he builds it signals to us uh, about how Solomon understood the Lord. And this is the, this is the first question that we're asking this morning. What is the one main thing that Solomon is signaling to us by the construction uh, of the temple? And I think the more that we meditate upon uh, the passage, 
the more it becomes obvious to us. So why don't you tell me the, the, the one main thing that Solomon is signal, signaling to us about the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, about Yahweh, about our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is the one main thing about him that Solomon is signaling by the way in which he constructs the temple? What, what does it mean, for example, in verse 3 and following that we get a basic understanding of the structure of this building. That is two things. Number one, that it is an, a, a tripart structure, a three-part structure, where there is a, 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 a patio, if you will, a vestibule, an entryway, and then you come into the second part, which is the main hall, if you will, and then the third part is separated off from the first two. It is the uh, innermost, what's called uh, toward the end of our text, or the later description of it, verse 16, uh, an inner sanctuary, a most holy place. What is signaled by this three-part structure? What is signaled by the uh, progressive elevation of these three parts, where you ascend stairs to the patio, and then you, uh, to the, the porch area, the vestibule area, and then you ascend stairs to go into the main hall, and then you must ascend further stairs into the inner sanctuary or the most holy place. What is signaled, for example, in verse 7, the fascinating detail that when the sanctuary was being built, it was with stone that was prepared at the quarry where it had been harvested. And not just the stone was prepared there to be put into place, but it, as a matter of fact, we get the impression hearing here no hammer, axe, any tool of iron, every piece of material that at any part in the structure of the temple was not allowed to be prepared on site, but as much as possible, it would be made beautiful, it would be decorated, it would be fashioned outside of the entire area. Prior to it coming here, of course, for what reason? So that there would be no noise in the house while it was being built. Why the silence? Uh, why, for example, also the, the perfect symmetry that's in the design and the structure of the temple? Uh, why is it most, most notable? Although if you took time and, and uh, carefully looked at all of the, the lengths, the cubits of the various aspects that are described, you would find perfect symmetry there. Uh, maybe it's made most explicit when it's describing the construction of the cherubim. Right, Five cubits was the length of one wing. Five cubits was the length of the other wing. Ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. The other cherub, same exact dimensions. Uh, the cherubim's wings extended at the same direction and the same length from themselves to the wall, and the other wings extended at the same length to touch the other. Perfect symmetry throughout the temple. Why? What is that signaling? The fact of the cherubim themselves even existing in the temple these mysterious artistic expressions of these beings, that invisible beings that exist in the heavenly realms. All of this and other details in the story can only signal one thing, and that is clearly that the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord God, Solomon says, who put me on the throne, the Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who will dwell in this temple, this is no ordinary God. This is no magnified man which has been made up by the imaginations of men and so they built him some temple in, uh, in the land where they live. And they seek to come there and give offerings and manipulate that God for their own purposes. But this God, the God of Israel, is holy. This God is, a to is in a totally different rank of being. He is self-sufficient. He is the personal absolute. He is the fount of life. He is completely pure, and he is the standard of purity, such that no human should think that he has the same level of access to existence or access to the Lord to be in his presence. This is why he is separated out in this three-part structure. This is why the progressive elevation symbolizes the elevation and rank of being, if you will, from humanity to the Lord of glory who made the 
not only the visible realm out of nothing, but the invisible realm in which the cherubim dwell, in which what the Old Testament calls the hosts of heaven. Are, they are not awesome and mysterious to God. God made them, and they are his servants attending to him to do his will. When we are fascinated and terrified when even anything from the angelic realm will reveal itself to humanity as we see throughout the scriptures, but imagine if we are terrified at the revelation of the cherubim how terrified we are or should be to think of God himself. For he is other, he is holy. The symmetry in the temple architecture speaks of God's order, the perfections of his nature. Not like the God of Islam, for example. The God of Islam who they say is so free that he is free to change what he has said. Uh, free to change his nature, which is very characteristic of false gods and idols. But our God is so pure that that can never change. He is so powerful that there is nothing apart from his holy will that he cannot accomplish. And those perfections are represented in the order and the symmetry of the temple. Uh, the noise is minimized, obviously, because this is, this is holy ground. This, yes, it is true that the Lord is everywhere, and uh, the Lord fills every space in all of his creation, but the reality is that when he decides to manifest his presence in a special way, to reveal his presence in a special way in the world, he is not to be trifled with there. And so even in the construction of this holy place, it must be silent. The Lord is in his temple, Habakkuk 2.20. Let all the world keep silent before him. This idea, the holiness of God, the transcendence of God, the purity of God, is what accounts for also the dizzying array of the finest and most expensive construction materials, the quality stone, the cedar beams, the boards and the paneling the pine flooring, the olive wood for the statuary, and most of all, right, in the story, most of all the gold. The gold which is the most valuable and the most brilliant to look upon. Only the gold and the almost waste of gold lavished upon every corner of the place of his presence in the temple. Uh, that alone can be begin to be humanity's response to the worth of, of this God who is holy. Uh, not, not even to mention uh, the, the, the beautiful carvings and decorations that, uh, that are on the walls. You might ask yourself, why the gourds, meaning the, um, the squash? Uh, why, why the open flowers? Why the palm trees? Maybe there's some royal imagery there with the palm trees uh, as part of it. But, but really, this is Solomon probably especially reflecting on uh, the Lord's brilliance and beauty in his creation. Uh, th this recalls the categories of, of created things that the Lord made to demonstrate his, his beauty and his glory and his creative brilliance. And it's, it's uh, Solomon's way of, of testifying to uh, the Lord being the giver of every good gift and, and of doing all things well, displaying uh, his image uh, among human creatures who enjoy the blessings of the natural realm. Uh, the Lord is holy and he is worthy uh, of this. You know, uh, I, I am not certain that any of us would have the presumption and the folly. Uh, had the Lord still decided in his wisdom to have a temple built for himself, a physical temple where he manifested his presence, I'm not certain that anybody here would be foolish enough to say um, with unwashed hands and with unconfessed sin, uh, back up 50 feet and do a full sprint right through the, um, the entryway of the temple and through into the inner hall, the main sanctuary, and right through uh, the gold chains and 
the curtain into the holy place. Nobody here would be foolish enough uh, to do that. And yet at the same time, it's uh, fascinating to, to me about myself and uh, fascinating to you, I hope, about yourself and fascinating to all of us about, uh, in general, the religious climate that conceives of and speaks of and, and talks of God and treats God and worships God, purports to worship God in a way that is completely different and unbefitting of the holiness and the transcendence of his character. Uh, there are so many ways in which the scripture applies uh, the holiness of God and the implications of that uh, for our lives. Uh, I, I was thinking in particular of how, uh, as I said, you know, we, we don't typically think of ourselves in, um, as members of God's covenant. Those who've been baptized, for example, into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who gather uh, with God's people regularly to call upon him in prayer and in praise. Those who partake of uh, the heavenly gift in the Lord's Supper um, by being lifted up by the Spirit to feast on Christ himself in, in the heavenly place. We don't typically think of ourselves as in, the, in this kind of a temple. We wouldn't approach something like that. But, but Hebrews says, listen, you want to think about Old, Man Old Testament manifestations of God's presence, whether it's the temple, whether it's the mountain where he gave his law to Moses. Let me tell you something, New Covenant Christians, about where you are. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire. And read in here, you have not come to an earthly temple. To darkness and gloom and to whirlwind here at the mountain. And to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words that are, so, that are such that those who heard them begged no further word be spoken to them. Uh, so terrible was that sight. So awful is the Old Testament specially manifested presence of the Lord even in its brilliance and glory in the temple, so mysterious, so forbidden. Right? But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. You have come by the Spirit to the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, not to cherubim-carved olive wood angels in some temple, but you have come to the heavenly places by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have come to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, the saints who have gone before us. And you've come to Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel, and any Old Testament sacrifice that could have been laid on that altar in that temple. And then he says, so, so what do you do with that? The only response for those who are privileged to have this kind of knowledge of and access to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Hebrews says a few things. First of all, um, clean up your life. People of God, we have spent enough time in prior, before our conversion to Christ, and we've spent enough time in our immaturity while we were brought into the kingdom. Uh, Hebrews says here, pursue, I'll give you a few things, he says, uh, in view of the holiness of God. He says this before he explains how close access we have to the Lord. Pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace with all men, as much as it depends on you, as much as it depends on me. Pursue peace with all men. Enough of the hostility, the undue suspicion, the always protecting my self-interest first. Uh, what about the roots of bitterness? Old, old, uh, old harboring problems in your marriage, un unforgiveness, um, not pursuing a clear conscience before the Lord and a joyful disposition and a cheerfulness. 
to say words and speak words of encouragement and also to carry that countenance with us because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us, but instead to be content with an in, turn inward and become bitter and cause trouble and be divisive and by it many are defiled. And don't be like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal, the materialism, the pleasures of this world. As if this world has anything for us that is more valuable than that which the God who has brought us into the heavenly places and cleansed us through the precious blood of Christ, earning for us the new heavens and the new earth, and yet when we, are, when we have many blessings, we, we, we take God's good gifts and we make them God's. And we are stingy with them. And we never have enough. And if we are poor, and, oh, by the way, and when we have more than others, we definitely point to ourselves and think that we are better than them and that's why we have it. And if everybody else would just get their act together, they'd have the same things we have. And then on the other hand, when we are without, we become embittered and envious and jealous of those whom the Lord has blessed, when we should be happy for them and with them. And we should learn, all of us, whether rich or poor, to be content. This is the implication of the holiness of God. I'm not making this up. This is where Hebrews says, after these admonitions there, he says, I say this to you because you have come to the heavenly place, which the temple was only an earthly symbol of, an earthly manifestation of. I, I have to say um, that, that an obvious uh, way in which the holiness of God in, in the text and the structure of the temple speaks to us today as well and to the church at large uh, is in uh, verse 28 here of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we receive this kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. How? By which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Like I said, nobody's going to, if there was a temple built today, nobody's going to run through there with shorts on through the three levels and up, the, up three flights of stairs and run into the holy place because they know they'll be consumed by fire. And yet we're closer to that, that intense holiness, the consuming fire of God, than they were in Old Testament times. But so many people today, when they conceive of God, will not privately or publicly worship Him in a way that is consistent with His holiness, with reverence and with awe. But they will trivialize Him. They will turn Him into a slogan. They'll put Him on bumper stickers. They'll put Him cheese ball statements on t-shirts. Um, they'll speak of the Lord very lightly and casually. They'll pray to him as if he's a boyfriend or girlfriend. Nothing wrong with uh, informal prayer, but it should always be thoughtful, loved ones. We don't approach God publicly or privately. It doesn't always have to be formal and printed prayers, memorized, what have you. It doesn't have to be theologically advanced, but it has to be thoughtful and respectful and awesome. Awesome when we come before the presence of the Lord is our understanding and our contemplation of who He is. With humility, confession, self-denial. You know, like the, the great saints in the scripture who, like the man who comes to the temple to pray. It's perfect application. The man who comes to the temple to pray, Jesus says. And one of them says, you know, I give my tithe, I say my prayers, and thank God I'm not like that guy. I praise you, Lord. And the other guy comes to the temple to pray, and just the thought of approaching God in prayer, he doesn't, first of all, he can't say anything. He falls on his knees, and he beats his chest, and he says, have mercy on me, a sinner. And of course, Jesus says, what, you know, which man walks away justified? Of course, it's that man. And this man's prayer is what is becoming of an acknowledgement of the holiness of God. Worship services uh, today turned into lounge acts. Uh, no proclamation of uh, the Lord's uh, absolute authority, his, his moral authority, his purity, his transcendence. Uh, let us offer to God in its form and in its intent and in its expression, reverent worship that expresses the awe of the worshiper to the, to the God 
of Solomon's temple. Now, the, uh, the second thing, if you will, that is the most striking about uh, Solomon's construction of the temple is that the Lord actually interrupts uh, the building, the process. And uh, he does that in the middle of verses 9 and 14. No notice something with me. So 1 Kings 6, 9. Solomon built the house and finished it. See that phrase? He finished it. Um, it's repeated in verse 14. Solomon built the house and finished it. And, and that's one way of uh, the author, by the Holy Spirit, bracketing the something that comes in the middle, which ends up probably being the most significant uh, 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 main lesson of the, the chapter, if you will. And it's, it's in verse 11, the word of the Lord coming to Solomon. Now here's where you have to remember the reason why Solomon is building the temple. Solomon is building the temple because he's acknowledging the Lord's blessing and, and putting him in the place where he is and that he's dependent on the Lord and that for the future security, he's depending on the Lord. You know, this is the only way, Lord, if you will be present among us, that we will maintain uh, prosperity. And uh, the Lord says to Solomon, okay, so I get that, but here, just so you know, It's not the building of the temple that's going to guarantee your prosperity and your blessing. Concerning this house that you are building, you see, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to your, your father David. And then... Conditioned upon your obedience, king, I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will not forsake my people Israel. Which, by the way, Solomon, the opposite is also true. If you fail to walk in my statutes, and if you disobey my rules, and you break my commandments, then I will judge you and I will abandon my people Israel. Uh, so it is not enough, Solomon, though it is good that you are uh, acknowledging that I have given you this gift and that you are dependent on my power and my blessing to maintain this gift and you uh, rightly reflect my holiness and my beauty and what I am worth in the way that you have designed and built this temple. Uh, it is not enough. What I require from you for uh, my blessing to lay upon you is your obedience. And uh, we mentioned it earlier this morning. Already by this time, there are a number of ways in which we have become concerned about Solomon's ability and willingness to meet these conditions so that the people of God will be blessed by his obedience. For one thing, uh, we had seen that uh, Solomon, in the establishing of his um, court, of his, uh, we would call it today, in the establishing of his administration, uh, he created a department of forced labor. And uh, we said, okay, that seems innocent because that forced labor is going uh, likely to make use of uh, the, uh, his enemies, those from other nations which may rise up against Israel and, and try to fight Solomon's armies, and when inevitably they'll be defeated by Solomon's armies, they will take prisoners of war, and they will bring them into labor camps, and they appointed a head of forced labor. But isn't it interesting that uh, we've already heard in uh, the chapter before, chapter 5, that uh, some of the laborers of of uh, those who were harvesting cedar in Lebanon to bring for the temple were Israelites. Forced labor. Israelites! 
by definition, what it meant to be an Israelite blessed of God, first of all, was not to be enslaved. They had been delivered by the Lord God out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, to be a people above all that displayed the blessing by their freedom. We know a little bit about that in our sociopolitical history. We understand and have treasured freedom. That's something that the Lord blessed the Israelites with, and Solomon already receiving riches from the Lord is conscripting, conscripting labor, not only from the, the Gentile nations, but from among Israelites. We saw King Solomon mm, establish very carefully crafted districts over which he appointed his relatives to ensure the flow of revenue to continue the uh, the resources that he needed, the financial resources for his uh, building projects. Incidentally, not only this temple which he is building, but he goes about after this to build his own palace, which if you thought the temple was amazing, <laughs> wait till you see the palace that Solomon starts building for himself. So already at this point, we've had uh, indications in the story, and there are others, but we have had indications in the story that uh, Solomon may... Uh, if he was thinking clearly, hear this word of the Lord and take pause. It, it seems that uh, he just carried on. Uh, but we, we know more of the story. Uh, we, we know that this is the Lord uh, himself getting our attention. Uh, that there is one who is greater than Solomon who finally will meet the conditions for the presence of God to be for his people a blessing and not a curse and a judgment, right? Uh, see, the holy God is, is uh, good news if you're aligned with him. And if you offer him the obedience that he requires such that you can dwell with him and, and that he will sh you know, pour his blessings out upon you. But he is a very bad news, if, if I may say it that way, the Holy God is the transcendent being uh, to those who, who, who are separated him because of their sinful stains. But isn't it glorious that in this incredible manifestation of God's presence and his holiness and transcendence that he brings before us the Lord Jesus, a description of him, who walks in the Father's statutes and obeys his rules and keeps all of his commandments and walks in them so that all of the blessings that the Lord had laid out, blessings that he had laid out to our first father Adam in the garden, you know, it was the opposite of what he said explicitly. If you disobey me, you will be cursed. Well, the opposite was true too, right? If you obey me, if you persevere in resisting the temptation to eat the fruit, then, then I will bless you. I will bring you into a, a glorified state. I will bring you into a place where you're not even susceptible possibly to fall anymore. You think the garden is good now? Wait till you see till it is confirmed in the goodness that I have said before you. Um, the goodness that he laid out to Abraham. Uh, ultimately, of a new heavens and a new earth of an unmatched prosperity, of a, of a... Remember when he brought Isaac up off the thicket? Before, when the angel interrupted Abraham, bringing the knife down on his neck? And Hebrews says, when God brought Isaac, sent the angel so that Isaac was spared and he came off the thicket, Isaac was as good as dead. And he was promising Abraham in that, the resurrection from the dead. That though we die in this age, we will live. We will live forever and we will not even be susceptible to sickness and death and cancer and disease and aging anymore. All of that laid out here. Because there is one who has kept the rules, kept all the commandments, walked in them, and the promise and the blessings of God are established through him. Through Jesus, the Lord dwells among his people and will never forsake us. This is, this is beautiful. I mean, look, it's fitting for Palm Sunday to remember that we have been made right with 
our holy God through the life, the obedient life, and the horrific death of Christ our Savior. King Jesus far out, he's, it's, look, he so far out surpasses um, King Solomon, it's, it's almost wrong to speak of them in the same sentence. But this is how Christ is presented to us in this passage. You know, Jesus, think of the contrast, the irony of King Jesus. He, he rides in on, on, a, on a donkey into the holy city. And there, there is no temple for him. In fact, he is the temple. And, and they destroy that temple so that we may live. And his, his resurrection, he's a beautiful temple, but it's, he's more beautiful than this temple of Solomon because he's the cornerstone and we are, we are the, the other materials of that temple that the Lord makes alive and decorates, bestows upon them the blessings of eternal life now, of a turn from godliness now, of salvation, of a clear conscience through the blood of Christ and his obedience uh, the hope of, of glory, the new heavens and the new earth, and we will be as beautiful as all the gold in the temple because we will enjoy uh, as co-heirs with Christ everything which he has earned for us by his obedient life and his blood. What, what, what other, I mean, this is magnificent. To be made the temple, the beautiful temple in which God himself dwells by his spirit, having been engrafted into Christ. And now to acknowledge God as the Holy One and to, to lay our lives before Him and to repent from our sins, to worship Him in an honorable way with reverence and awe. People of God, behold your King and, and the privilege of being a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. Amen. Let us pray. Uh, thank you, King Jesus, for by your obedience, by your blood, by your spirit, making yourself as the chief cornerstone, dressed and beauteous beyond our imagination now, making us united to you as a dwelling place of the